so hello everyone welcome to this session uh, there were some technical problems because of which it took some time so i hope that you have done your paper nicely well and what i see is i can not see yeah now is the correct thing. <clears throat> so let's talk with ant questions good morning so sorry for the delay there were some technical problems and i hope the audio is clear the visual is clear so this is your first question which said a patient with a history of chronic middle ear infection now presented with neurological manifestations headache and vomiting a ct scan is shown in the image so you can see there is a enhancing mass inside the temporal lobe <clears throat> and the question was choices were temporal lobe abscess cerebral abscess extradural abscess and meningitis so it's a very simple question we all know temporal lobe abscess is the correct answer and temporal lobe abscess or most common cause of cerebral abscess or you can say brain abscess is csom so there is a history of chronic otitis media csom already and brain abscess in csom is a very very common intracranial complication now from the ear infection can enter the brain via two routes either through a dural plate directly or via <coughs> cp angle through dural plate it usually goes to the temporal bone temporal lobe like this one so this was a temporal lobe abscess that means the infection has gone directly through the tegment tympani the roof of the ear but if it goes via cp angle then it could be postcranial fossa so posterior fossa abscess are also possible okay slide is not changing <clears throat> let me restart let's see i'm restarting the pp powerpoint there seems to be some problem yeah now it's okay <clears throat> so i'll repeat this question it says that a patient with a history of chronic middle ear infection now presents with neurological manifestations and headache and vomiting ct scan is shown probable diagnosis this was one of the easier questions and the answer you can see straight away there is a uh, enhancing mass in the temporal lobe and this is straight away the temporal lobe 
abscess. Temporal lobe abscess. We all know that the, I just told you that the most common cause of brain abscess is CSUM. So, this is CSUM with brain abscess and in brain abscess, the most common site is the temporal lobe which is shown in the image. The second important site is the posterior fossa and whether the uh, abscess will happen in the temporal bone or the posterior fossa really depends on the route the infection takes. If the infection goes directly through the roof of the ear which is tegment tympani dural plate then this one happens the temporal lobe which is shown which is more common but by chance if the infection goes via the uh, via the uh, sitilis angle sinodural angle or sitilis angle which is in the posterior part of the mastoid you know from the ear it goes to the mastoid and then the chances of posterior kinal fossa uh, abscess or posterior lobe abscess is more common and when there is an abscess, it causes neurological defect, pressure symptoms will happen and this is what is saying that there are neurological defects with an increased cranial pressure can cause headache and vomiting. So, this is about this. <coughs> Second question. Second question says, a woman is presented to the ENT OPD with complaints of nasal obstruction. On examination, greenish black crust is seen in the nasal cavity covering turbinates and septum. Mercifronosmia is also present. What is the, what are the sign will you find in this case on examination? Do you see roomy cavity, nasal polyps, foreign body, inferior turbinate, hypertrophy? Simple question, straight away, we all know that this is atrophic rhinitis. This is a very typical feature of atrophic rhinitis where Again, the slide is not changing. What is happening? Bad day. It's a bad day, my friend. Sorry for all this clumsiness. Can you now see? Yes, still the slides are not showing. Something seems to be wrong. I think the background is a problem. There is some problem with the capture. Uh, yes, first slide is temporal lobe abscess. We cannot see the rest of the slides. Uh, it's not changing. Something is a problem. <clears throat> so, give me some time. Uh, give me 10 minutes, I'll come back and let me fix it.
let me take the help of some technical guys and then I'll come back and we'll restart in 10 minutes. Okay, at 11.30 we'll restart, 11.30 again. So I'm stopping it now. We'll come back, stay, don't go at 11.30. Let me fix this. So coming back guys, this was the first slide, sorry for the problem that created. This was the first slide, uh, brain abscess, temporal lobe abscess due to CSUM is the diagnosis, we have done this. So this is the second question. <coughs> uh, you uh, hang newer, you restart go back to the uh, link and start seeing restart it's not hanging i can see on my uh, on my phone it's working very nicely <clears throat> yeah so this is a qu second question a woman is present to the ent opd with complaints of nasal obstruction on examination green black crust seen in nasal cavity covering turbinates and septal septum merciful anosmia is also present what other sign will you find in this case on examination? Clearly, this is a case of atrophic rhinitis. It's a very simple question. In every lecture, we talk about this. <clears throat> and one of the features of atrophic rhinitis is roomy cavity. So, A is the correct answer. And these are foreign body is nothing to do with atrophic rhinitis. And this is atrophy. It cannot have hypertrophy. Atrophy and hypertrophy are opposite words, isn't it? So, in atrophy, you cannot have hypertrophy of anything. <clears throat> so, yes, you are right. Rumi cavity is the correct answer. And in, uh, we all know this. Uh, if you have attended my recent lectures, you will know that I keep telling you in rhinosinusitis, this is the most important topic. I keep telling you in rhinosinusitis, which is a huge topic, <clears throat> this is the most important topic. And lo and behold, we have a question from here. Third question, a 35 year old male presented with epistaxis. Conservative management was done to stop the bleeding, but it failed. Which is the next step of management? Maxillary artery ligation or TESPAL? TESPAL we all know is a transnasal endoscopic sphenoplatin artery. This is sphenoplatin artery ligation. Then there is internal carotid artery ligation and external carotid artery ligation. So when your epistaxis uh, stops, uh, the conventional treatment fails in epistaxis and we start ligating, the first artery that we will ligate is the sphenoplatin artery. Sphenoplatin artery ligation which is a branch of maxillary artery. So we first try sphenoplatin artery ligation and if that fails, then we start ligating, we think about maxillary artery ligation. Now you might read old books which says that after in epistaxis, if you have to ligate the artery, the fir first artery we ligate is the maxillary artery. <clears throat> you might read that. But this was true in olden days when we did not have endoscope. Because without endoscope, ligating a sphenoplatin artery is very, very difficult. Because if you remember, the diagram that I draw of the nose, the sphenoplatin foramen is here and the artery comes from here. So you have to go through the nasal cavity and go to the posterior end of the nose and ligate it here. We basically clip the artery. We put a clip there, it gets blocked. <coughs> That's why it's called TESPAL, tra transnasal. See, the name tells you transnasal means through the nose, endoscopic sphenoplatin artery ligation. Maxillary artery is behind the maxilla. It is behind the maxilla. So, for maxillary artery ligation, we have to do a cardwell lux surgery. Cardwell lux surgery. You must have heard this name, cardwell lux surgery. 
So through cardiac lung surgery, we go into the maxilla, and through the maxilla, we go behind the maxilla. So we have to make the opening on the posterior wall of the maxilla, and then you go behind the maxilla. Behind the maxilla lies the foramen called a uh, fossa called pterygo palatine fossa and infra temporal fossa. So this artery lies in those fossas, infra temporal fossa and <coughs> pterygo palatine fossa. So you have to go through the maxilla by doing a cardiac surgery, which is a very big surgery. But in the olden days, when we did not have endoscope, there was no option. So we had to do this cardiac surgery and ligate the maxillary artery. But with the advent of endoscope, now you don't have to do this such a big surgery. You can go very easily through the nose and ligate. Just clip this artery here. No incision, no scar, no bleeding, nothing happens. So this is the best option. Now why I'm explaining this? Because one of the students yesterday told me that is read that uh, some way it says that is maxillary artery. So must have read the old book, some old book, which when before the endoscope. And if this also fails, the third artery is the external carotid artery. This is the last option we have. But we never like it the internal carotid because as you know, if we like it the internal carotid, then patient will have serious problems. The brain supply will go off, isn't it? Of course, uh, if this fails, we like it anti modal artery. <coughs> anti modal artery is the last one that we like it. And uh, this is a sequence that we follow and it's given in every notes of mine if you read this. Next one. A child of tonsillectomy was lying in the ward. He started bleeding in the ward. Which of the following should be done? So it is post tonsillectomy and the patient is in the ward. That means it is what? It is reactionary bleeding. Isn't it? Uh, during the surgery is primary bleeding. Within 24 hours is reactionary and 5 to 8 they are is secondary. So in the ward means obviously surgery is over. It cannot be primary. And patient stays in the ward for around 24 hours. So it is reactionary bleeding. And we all know in reactionary bleeding, the most important thing is re-ligation. The spelling is wrong. Ligation. So re-ligation is the treatment. So take to the OPT, remove the clot. And whichever choice is re-ligation or ligation, that's the correct answer. So A is the correct answer, re-ligation. You're all right, absolutely right. Uh, <coughs> Pressure package is done for primary bleeding, isn't it? Pressure package is done for primary bleeding and for bleeding, we never do conservative management in bleeding because bleeding is an emergency, not only this, any bleeding. From ACI, bleeding is an emergency, in emergency, we have to stop the bleeding. So conservative management never works and of course, if, if your pressure fails in primary bleeding, if the pressure fails, then we do cautery. But all this is an option only for primary bleeding, not for reactionary or secondary bleeding. In reactionary and secondary bleeding, you have to go for ligation or re-ligation. So any choice which says re-ligation or ligation obviously becomes the correct answer. <clears throat> so once again, uh, if you remember, I always tell you in tonsil, the most important topic in tonsil is tonsillectomy. And in tonsillectomy, the most important topic is complication. And in complication, the most important topic is bleeding. So it is exactly that they have asked. Right. Look at the image of the vial and indicate the use of this for the choices from the choices given. For subglottic stenosis, inlet type meringoplasty, post adenoidectomy to control bleeding and rhinocerebral mucormycosis. <clears throat> so again, uh, it's a simple question. I have talked about this in my lectures. So clearly, it is subglottic stenosis. Mitomycin either prevents stenosis or treats already formed stenosis. The already formed stenosis of any site. In ENT, we use it for nasal stenosis after nasal surgery, laryngeal stenosis and tracheal stenosis. These are the three uses of mitomycin C in ENT, nasal, laryngeal and tracheal. 
and this one is about larynx subglottis is a part of larynx laryngeal stenosis you can use mitomycin it can be used for any stenosis for that matter it is also used for intubation granuloma if you remember intubation granuloma one of the options is mitomycin it's a anti chemo uh, uh, it's a anti cancer drug but it's very effective in preventing already formed stenosis in ent as i said the mo yeah local it's always local it's always local uh, uh, systemic is used for cancers malignancies local is used to prevent stenosis <clears throat> as i said likewise saying in ent the most common use is nasal stenosis it's very commonly used because after nasal surgeries like septoplasty and fess the uh, chances of stenosis is very very high and so what we have began doing is when we pack the nose after surgery packing we in the pack we mix this mix this in the pack and put into the nose and that pack smeared in mitomycin c is going to prevent and avoid stenosis but for some by some means or by some chance if the stenosis gets formed already then again we can use the same drug to prevent stenosis it has nothing to do with stopping bleeding and all that in meningoplasty we don't use any medicine okay uh, yeah it was uh, as i said aureus it is about topical we always use topical so in this case <clears throat> yeah so i did not uh, i did not write a topical so i should have used i mentioned topical use so yeah uh, you know that uh, we get questions from you guys so whatever you guys tell us we based on that uh, we frame the question so maybe the choices also maybe not were all the choices same or there was some different thing so i'll request you that if if there is any change in the question or any choice and if you remember re recall better just let me know so that for future i can use the correct question and the correct choices but all these choices have come from you guys all these uh, questions have come from you guys so i thank you all from the bottom of my heart for helping me frame these questions so that we can sit down and discuss them now <clears throat> next one a patient of thyroidectomy was being extubated the anesthesiologist realized that when he removes the tube the patient begins to have recurrent cyanotic spell which of the following could be the cause of this bilateral recurrent laryngeal palsy unilateral recurrent laryngeal palsy bilateral superior laryngeal palsy and hemorrhage again a very straightforward question very simple question if vocal cord palsy nerve damage causes cyanosis it has to be bilateral recurrent laryngeal palsy which is also called bilateral abductor palsy yes so in bilateral abductor palsy <clears throat> the symptoms are good voice and dyspnea so dyspnea causes stenosis in unilateral palsy the only complaint is hoarseness the only complaint is hoarseness in this case it is aphonia plus aspiration and hemorrhage is of course a uh, different thing hemorrhage will not <coughs> if there is a hemorrhage uh, uh, who is asking why not hemorrhage vikram vikram is asking why not hemorrhage uh, if you have a hemorrhage in the larynx uh, in in thyroidectomy hemorrhage is outside because thyroidectomy is never from inside thyroidectomy is always done from the outside so bleeding is going to happen outside the pharyngeal wall so if you have outside hemorrhage a you are a surgeon so you will control the bleeding you will never close the larynx the patient uh, the anesthesiologist is uh, extubating the patient that means the surgery is complete you have uh, stitched it up you have uh, applied the bandage and think about you, you think just about thing if there is a hemorrhage happening 
after the surgery of thyroidectomy will the surgeon ever close and apply the bandage and allow intubation extubation no the fact that it is being extubated proves that there is no hemorrhage <clears throat> and certainly in laryngectomy in thyroidectomy hemorrhage is never inside it is always outside right and we all know in thyroidectomy vocal cord palsy is a very common problem no nerve gets damaged any nerve superior laryngeal nerve can get damaged recurrent can get damaged external can get damaged and depending on which nerve is damaged there are various symptoms and this is what they ask you and this is what they asked so in my lectures i i frame a chart if you remember i am frame a chart if you have attended my lecture where i say the laryngeal is divided by vagus through superior laryngeal and recurrent laryngeal superior then divided into internal laryngeal external laryngeal and recurrent remains recurrent so these are the three nerves ultimately if this is damaged it is only aspiration if this is damaged it is uh, low pitch voice and if this is damaged either hoarseness or dyspnea so see this is about dyspnea sinusis dyspnea means has to be recurrent laryngeal nerve straight away isn't it so if you have followed this chart which i draw in all the exam in all my lectures in all my lectures i draw this and i highlight very very uh, i really put stress on this that you have to have to remember this because this is very very confusing otherwise i hope uh, it clarifies your point vikram <clears throat> yes cricothyroid paralysis will cause uh, low pitch voice which happens in this case external laryngeal right hematoma one of the choices but it is not the correct answer uh, i don't know what i kavya sri ramu then vikram hemorrhage will compress the trachea that may cause sinusis but okay for a, for uh, uh, for discussion sake uh, let's uh, uh, talk about what vikram is saying he is saying if there is a hemorrhage from outside it may compress the trachea and so cause stenosis but then it will not be recurrent because hemorrhage is not going to wax and wane hai na hemorrhage hoga to there will be a continuous pressure and there will be no recurrent sinuses are you i i hope you get this and to miss a hemorrhage uh, after thyroidectomy so much hemorrhage that it is causing, causing the pressure in the trachea is uh, you have to be you cannot be a surgeon if you are missing this hemorrhage on the neck which is so much that it is causing the compression of the trachea and causing obstruction and sinuses then you are not a surgeon you are a butcher you are something else <laughs> you cannot be a surgeon okay <clears throat> primary hemorrhage it is outside as i said it is not inside you know outside hemorrhage to cause compression has to be huge hemorrhage huge hematoma and as i said a, a surgeon will never miss that andar to kuch karte nahi hai na you are not doing anything in the in thyroidectomy surgery you are not doing anything inside so inside there will be no hemorrhage it is not possible <clears throat> i hope uh, you get uh, what i am trying to say ha na next one a patient has undergone mandibulectomy gland excision and the wartons duct was ligated in the process which of the following nerve is most likely to be damaged during the surgery hypoglossal nerve lingual nerve glossopharyngeal nerve cauda tympani nerve <clears throat> uh, can you tell me the choices uh, uh, guys uh, are these correct choices because this is what i got yes the answer is lingual nerve you are right but i am telling you where these four choices given or there was something else i have confirmed the first three were given i don't know okay inferior alveolar okay inferior alveolar is given this was not given instead of this inferior alveolar was given isn't it one of the option was alveolar nerve alveolar nerve is here isn't it mandible is here so obviously you will never damage <clears throat> nerve to mylohyoid was given pulagam is saying pulagam jeeva nanda gopal is saying that one of the nerve was uh, choice was nerve to mylohyoid was that given guys nerve to mylohyoid okay so 
I am sure this was not given. Nerve to mylohyoid. Nerve to mylohyoid. <coughs> right. But the answer is lingual nerve. Because again, EFF, now please listen to this. This is very interesting. The difference is when they ask you Wharton's duct ligation in mandibular duct excision. Now, close to the Wharton's ducts are two nerves, this one and this one. Actually, Wharton ducts lies between these two nerves. Right. So, when you try to ligate the Wharton's nerve, the chance of lingual nerve damage is both the nerves is high, but lingual is closest because lingual is crossing the duct. Lingual nerve crosses the duct, so it gets damaged very easily. Hypoglossal is the next commonly damaged nerve. Nerve to mylohyoid is in the tongue, is in the tongue, and inferior alveolus is on the ear in the mandible, which is very far off from here. So these two nerves are not commonly damaged, they cannot be. But I'll, I'm talking about another thing. Now, if this is not mentioned that Wharton's is ligated, suppose just they talk about submandibular gland excision. And now they ask you that which is the most commonly damaged nerve in a submandibular gland excision, then the answer is cervical branch of fascia. This is the most commonly nerve damage overall in a submandibular gland excision because the nerve, uh, the facial nerve is divided into five branches here. One of the branch goes here and supplies this cervical area on the skin. And when you give an incision here, the skin incision, that incision may damage this nerve. So cervical branch of the facial damage is a very common uh, nerve damage in man submandibular gland excision. That's why when we give an incision, we get we take a margin of two centimeters from the ramus of the mandible. We take two, we put two fingers here, and then we give an incision below that, and we we dissect the whole skin with the platysma. Skin with the platysma is lifted, not we don't dissect the skin and then platysma and all that because the nerve, this nerve is between that area. Okay, so was this choice? I'm sure this was not given in the choice. Okay, patient had a lot of pain also. Was this given? Lot of pain? Kundru is saying there was a lot of pain in the patient. Is that true? Nitu is saying no. Please clarify pain in the Khawata Kini. No. Okay. Good. Next one. <clears throat> Again, a radiology question. A child was. A child was brought by mother with history of dysphagia. On inquiry, she informed that the child was playing alone. X-ray images are given, most likely sight of foreign body. This is a very popular thing. Uh, in radiographs of ENT, we always talk about this because uh, this is this tells how to differentiate a coin. This is a coin, foreign body. How to differentiate a coin on X-rays, whether it is in the trachea is larynx or the esophagus and in the AP view if you can see in the whole coin the whole ring and in the lateral view if you see the side rim then it is esophagus right it is esophagus now in the trachea also you can have the same finding the same finding can be seen in trachea also on AP view right larynx is opposite larynx is opposite and bronchial foreign body is somewhere here, lower down. Bronchus is here, not up there. So this is not possible. Larynx is opposite of this. That means on AP view, you see the rim in larynx. And on lateral view, you see the whole, whole coin. Now, the, uh, the doubt is between this and this. Two things. A, dysphagia. In laryngeal foreign body, in tracheal foreign body, there will be no dysphagia because we don't swallow through the larynx or the trachea. Dysphagia clearly means it is food path. Esophagus is the only possibility now. That's one thing. Second thing is that 
in a ap view you cannot differentiate between these two trachea and esophagus on ap view you cannot differentiate they look the same but in side view lateral view a uh, esophagus is posterior esophageal forward body is going to be here trachea is in front esophagus is behind so you see you can make out the tracheal shadow so the foreign body is within the tracheal air shadow uh, the esophageal foreign body is very close to the vertebral body so the side view will give you is it trachea or esophagus the front view may not be able to give you and saya <coughs> uh, bana is asking me what is the management of course in a esophageal foreign body we have to do esophagoscopy esophagoscopy under general anesthesia rigid we have to use a rigid esophagoscope and we'll have to remove the foreign body and if it is in the trachea then we have to do rigid bronchoscopy we have to do bronchoscopy we don't use the word endoscopy endoscopy is not the right word here it is not the don't use the word endoscopy supratic pal okay that's a wrong term to use endoscopy is a different thing <clears throat> option was soft tissue no you don't have to do tracheostomy tracheostomy in foreign body is not required in esophagus you never do a tracheostomy why will you do a tracheostomy even if it is in bronchus we uh, esophagus is a correct answer esophagus is a correct answer without any doubt <coughs> and like i said even if the foreign body is in the bronchus we don't do tracheostomy see tracheostomy if i use the first image the tracheostomy is here here is the area of the tracheostomy and tracheostomy is used to do bypass i mean bypass the obstruction if the obstruction is here tracheostomy ke niche then how is your tracheostomy going to help isn't it in foreign body of the trachea trachea bronchus tracheostomy is a useless effort it is never required it is never done please keep that in mind and we don't wait and watch uh, because the child has dysphagia it is stuck in the esophagus wait and watch is when it is here in the stomach when it comes in the stomach then you wait and watch but if it's stuck in the esophagus we don't wait and watch we have to do esophagoscopy straight away <clears throat> okay it is stuck esophagus you know you know has three constrictions due to carotid artery due to the tracheal bifurcation and there uh, there are some constrictions in the esophagus and the foreign body gets stuck there most of the time and so it will not go down if you think it will go down usually no it will not given is a microscopic image of papillae of the tongue identify the papillae is it circumvallate fungiform or foliate now i don't know the exact image so i uh, because uh, the histopathological image of all the four may look very similar if you are not careful about it if you don't know it this is not an ent question per se it's a histology question so it's either anatomy histology or maybe even uh, pathology but not ent but i thought they will not discuss nobody in the anatomy or the physiology histopathology is going to discuss so i thought i'll just tell you so one thing is i don't know the exact image so we don't know the answer right but this image is circumvallate papillae this one this particular is circumvallate papillae it could be a different image i'll show you the images so that you know the difference between them and this is a roundish shape you know it is round like this esophagus circumvallate papillae which is uh, in the posterior one third of the tongue you know just behind the just in front of the sulcus terminalis fungi form is uh, described like a uh, what like a mushroom shape it's described like mushroom shape and filiform is cone shaped very sharp cone shaped and foliate is club shaped and this is round is called round shape 
on histopathology. <laughs> so really, we uh, I don't know what was the image, but I'll show you all the. See, this is uh, the explanation uh, how the uh, circumvallate looks like. Another diagram. It is quite wide and it narrows down. Yeah. Now see, this is foliate. This is filiform. Cone shape. This is filiform. Cone shape like this. And this is mushroom. This is called mushroom shape. So this is fungiform. Mushroom shape. This is circumvallant. You can see up is broad as you go, go down it narrows down. Opposite of this, see this one which is fungiform is like this. This is small, this is wide <clears throat> and it is suddenly going like this to become like a mushroom and this is gradually going down, up like this. It is not mushrooming suddenly like this. It's not going like this. This is the difference between fungiform and foliate and filiform as I said is this uh, cone shaped and uh, the other one foliate is club shaped club <clears throat> another diagram this is filiform see filiform this is circumvallate this is fo foliate a uh, fungiform this is fungiform so just to show you how different uh, papillae look like and just remember in filiform there is no taste buds in filiform, there is no taste buds. The rest of them, they have the taste buds. <clears throat> Light question was, point source illuminates, illuminates, it is illuminated. Okay. <clears throat> and this is a question, again, anatomy question, where the sagittal section of the Cadaveric section was given and it says a patient was admitted with skull based trauma. The doctor was testing the marked structure which is the following nerve is being tested. As you can see, uh, this arrow is at the soft palate, vagus, facial, glossopharyngeal or trigeminal. Some people though say that the arrow was at the posterior wall. So this is one thing, please confirm that soft palate, right? So soft palate, the sensory supply comes mainly from the glossopharyngeal nerve plus uh, lesser uh, palatine nerve also has a slight contribution which is a man, a maxillary nerve. Maxillary nerve also has some, okay, short palate, very good, short palate. So most of you are saying short palate, so I will go with soft palate, not posterior wall. And if it is posterior wall, then the answer is uh, different, that is why. It could be a 10th nerve. It goes to the wall, it could be a 10th nerve. But in the palate, the main sensory of the entire oropharynx is glossopharyngeal nerve. But if they say glossopharyngeal plus lesser petrosal, palatine nerve, then this is the best answer. But if lesser palatine is not given in the choices, still you go with glossopharyngeal nerve. Right? So, uh, in the palate, in the entire oropharynx, the taste as well as sensory is the 9th nerve. We know this. But the muscles of the palate are mainly supplied by the 10th nerve except tensor veli platinae which is supplied by the mandibular division of trigeminal. So remember this, tensor veli platinae is supplied by the mandibular division of trigeminal. Rest of the muscles of the palate are supplied by the 10th uh, nerve. The sensory of the entire oropharynx is the 9th nerve but there is a lesser palatine nerve supplying a bit of tonsil and bit of the palate also. And posteropharyngeal wall is predominantly the vagus nerve. But this is controversial because we all know this area is supplied by the plexus, pharyngeal plexus which is 9th as well as 10th nerve. So there is, there are books which is saying the posterior pharyngeal wall is supplied by the 9th nerve. Since it is supplied by 9th nerve, not the 10th nerve, that is also there. But it is actually very difficult because it is a plexus at the end of the day. Right? So this was the, <coughs> it is not, this, uh, it was not about gag reflex. I do not think the gag reflex was mentioned. <coughs> Please tell me, uh, was that Nitu is saying that gag reflex was mentioned? Is is that true? Was it written as indirect about gag? Was the word gag reflex mentioned there? <clears throat> uh, 
okay ravindra is saying that in question of cyanosis uh, edema was also mentioned laryngeal edema was also mentioned is it true guys is was the edema of the laryngeal also mentioned <clears throat> indirectly gag reflex yeah okay see if you have to uh, elicit a gag reflex then you have to touch the pharyngeal wall not the palate palate ko touch karne se gag reflex nahi hota you have to touch the posterior pharyngeal wall to elicit the gag reflex that's why there is a controversy where what is pointing pointing at the palate so i told you both the things if if it was pointing at the palate it is glossopharyngeal if it is pointing at the posterior pharyngeal wall it is the tenth now itna yaad rakho that should be okay <clears throat> okay now uh, what is this question you are discussing question was about point source illuminance and candela what is this no edema in larynx no edema was mentioned somebody saying okay the patient has rt and the doctor was checking a reflex somebody says doctor was checking a reflex okay definitely soft palate somebody saying injury to the skull base can't swallow can't swallow was mentioned guys can't swallow was it mentioned the patient can't swallow please says somebody advise inform me in that question of palate last question was can't swallow written there patient cannot swallow because that will that might then it cannot be palate that it has to be first pharyngeal wall not mentioned ganesh is saying it was not mentioned so thank you for that uh, for your feedback <laughs> paper was made by dr peku <laughs> dr <Doctor. laughs> okay so thank you guys for attending i hope you had done very well in the exams we really hope that you come off with fly, uh, flying colors so that we can all have a good party but till then till your uh, result enjoy your time because then uh, iniset is coming up very soon so you have to start preparing for iniset exam also the next second episode of iniset and till then take care goodbye and god bless you <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you.